You've got to get on with life or your paperwork piles up, your your things you got to do, your family issues. You just got to live life and we got to love one another. And we also, in that love for one another, we cannot be ones that judge people because they don't do what we think they should do. Really, shouldn't we all be about the will of God? Remember Jesus, Jesus at 12, his parents couldn't find him in the caravan, right, in the group. And for two days they search. They go back to Jerusalem. They find him in the temple. I must be about my father's business. So what was Christ's opinion? His truth. He must be doing what his father must be doing. He wasn't so concerned at that moment what his parents were thinking, right? It, what really matters is what does our God think about us? What truth has he released into our lives? And what are we living as an actuality? What are we actually carrying in heavenly presence that we release where we go? Do you think it's more important to watch a person's scope or to... Uh, to go out and lead someone to Christ. I don't know. It could be a situation, right? I'm not saying one is more important than the other, but there's a time for all things. Isn't it Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes uh, speaks about that, teaches that truth. Judy, welcome on FB Live. So today, is it really that important? So one of the things I'd like to do this week is get into declarations. That's something Pastor Jay has been doing in the Kingdom Encounters Church for the, this month is releasing declarations because we live in this world. I did a post the other day on Facebook. Some of you have seen it about living life from our head, from our head. In other words, we try to figure out how it's going to work, how it's going to go. Danielle, so good to have you here. So what a blessing, and uh, may you just have the incredible peace of your Father lifting you to your, your purposes and plans that he has for you, which are amazing. So, yeah, where was I going with that? So, um, declarations. That God, uh, we need to declare what God has declared about us, and we need to uh, correspondingly act according to that. Now, our head doesn't fit into kingdom truth. It doesn't. The senses cannot fit into spiritual realities because they're greater. And as we live the reality of what God has declared, spiritual truth, kingdom reality, kingdom life, we can choose from the heart to walk it out. Do you know that the scriptures declare that actually faith and fear issue from the heart? That's why we read things like, or at least we could relate to this, however you want to see it, that, what was it, Job, the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. Because Jesus said that, he didn't in these exact words, but he showed that fear comes from the heart and faith comes from the heart. So what are we filling our head that gets into our heart, that gets into our life, that would become Robert, so good to have you here, Pam. Pam, wonderful scope this morning. You're always bringing a great word. I hear when I hear that love word. When you say love, it just touches me because you're saying, aren't like, aren't we to love one another? Really, when it comes down to it, aren't we to love for one another? Now, I want you to think about this. I maybe didn't complete that whole concept of the head and heart, but we need to live from the heart, from truth, from faith. What is it? That aim of the charge. Our charge is genuine love that comes from a pure conscience that is from genuine faith, right? We need to be genuine. We don't want to be hypocrites. That's actors on a stage, right? It's, it's a, a reference term that we're not people acting out who we want people to think we are or what we want uh, people to perceive that we are. Can we just be real? I don't know. I'm not so perfect at this either, but I tell you, uh, we try to get real all the time. I know Robert's real, Pam's real, we, we just, and others of you, we're just about being real. So no one, I want to give you a concept here, no one can lead others further than they have gone themselves. Did you get that? No one can lead others further than they have gone themselves. So in our study of scripture, if I make study of the scripture my great work so which i've spent quite a few years in study of the scripture but it became so much that the study of the scripture like usurped if that's the right word got kind of came above the leading of the spirit so how many signs miracles and wonders was i having even how many people were getting saved not 
that many because it became my whole life when I have a perfectly renewed mind, which if you have a perfectly renewed mind, please come and hang out with me, right? Or I need to come and hang out with you. Or I have a perfect understanding of scripture. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's anybody, if, if we're going to get perfect theology, let's look at Jesus Christ because he lived perfect theology, right? So anyway, no one can go further than they've been led. So we need to go further and we need to look to him who is the way, the truth, and the life, our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he's always the one that's going to take us further, not in the things of the world, but the things of God and things of the Spirit. So do we need study of the Word? Do we need to rightly divide it? It's so vital because things are often, yeah, not, not rightly divided. And so we, we ha don't have a true word, but we have a word of error. And if we walk in a word of error, we walk in defeat when we think we're doing the right thing. It's kind of like the, uh, there's that saying. What's that saying about... Um, the definition of insanity, the definition of, see my mind kind of working there, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing, getting no results, but you keep doing it and expecting the same results. That's true only to an extent. Here's why. Ask, seek, and knock, right? Pray always. You, when you have a promise of God, you know something's true. The promise of God is yes and amen in Christ. We have the petitions, 1 John 5, that we've requested of him. When you ask according to his word, you're asking, seeking, knocking. You're, you're seeking God in a situation for the answer, for the truth, for the release of heaven's supply. That you have a truth. You don't stop praying because you prayed 20 times and it didn't work. Now, we're not like the fair, the religious people. The religious people we know that Christ talked about, they stand on the street corners and they pray these prayers to look spiritual. We go into our closet with our Father. And it was George Mueller who said, and maybe others have said it, that the one great fault, and I thank you for the hearts and shares and everything here that you all are doing. The one great fault of the children of God is that when they know something is God's will, they don't keep praying till it comes to pass. And he would say, I have hundreds of prayers, thousands of prayers being answered, and many daily, because when I know it's of God, I persist till the answers come. We cannot be children who quit early in the game, right? We can't, third quarter, whatever quarter of the game of life it is, if you want to put it that way, and it's not a game, it's a reality of living the love life, the love call, uh, the love vision he gives us. But we can't be quitters. We can't. And how do we not become quitters? We surround ourselves with other faithful believers who can also encourage us, lift us, strengthen us, as we all are looking to him who is the way, right? So this is why we follow Christ. This is, I'm going to give a little thing that I just wrote here. This is why we follow the one who is the way, because he passed through the heavens, pierced every darkness, defeated death, took us from defeat and despair, and he sent the Spirit of the Father, whereby we cry, Abba, dear, loving, compassionate, and gracious Father. That's why we follow him. I don't know anybody else that's defeated death. Muhammad, right, Muhammad didn't defeat death, right? Any of those other guys that re people follow, they died, they're dead, right? Okay, Javon, good morning. Nice to have you here. So, we want to have declarations for what God has done in our lives. And the thing is, now I'm in my wrong note. I see this is not where I want to go. So we have in Ephesians, we have this, I want to go in a few different places today, a few different directions, and we'll see if we can pull it together. If not, you can tell me that was a fail, right? Okay, so we're, but we're climbing to victory here. We're on our way up to the mountaintop to get a greater view of life and living. So Ephesians 4.23, put off the old self, the old man, the old nature that was crucified with Christ, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt according to deceitful desires like lust desires, right? And uh, be, re you know, and lust is basically over desire for something. It's not a natural desire. It's an over desire. You know, it's out of control. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self. So I'm going to get a new figure in my mind, Romans 12 too, right? 
and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we want to live in holiness. And there was a scripture the other day in the Old Testament about the beauty of holiness. True beauty is found in holiness and in the righteousness, the right way of living that our Father has given us. So we, each of us, right here, we're I'm I'm influenced by you by the notes you put in, right? And the no, things you send me and all, or contacts. I'm influencing you because I'm speaking words that we communicate. We speak English here, right? For the most part, I think. And I'm communicating words that have an influence on your life. So we need to guard our lips. That was uh, David who said, put a guard on my lips, a watch. Because I don't want to speak anything over my life or over others that isn't life freeing, life lifting, you know, truth supporting, uh, love empowering. That we cross paths with many people and they each have an influence on us. So we need to have a guard on our ears too that we guard what's coming into our heads and hearts. That is so right. The words of life, we need to speak those words, Scott, and uh, live those. Thank you. So see, Scott just had an influence on me and a godly influence. And there's people, wherever we go, they're going to have an influence on us. Look, you're driving your car. If someone's in front of you or passing you or whatever, they have an influence on your life in some way. But our, is our influence having a godly impact for increase of the things of God? So now I want to go into some things to consider. Probably not so important, right? This is a not so important. Can someone, we'll do that too. I don't usually do this, but can someone put not so important in the chat stream? Not so important. Whoops, I gotta grab this. Okay, not so important. Yes, I've got great, Judy, it's so great to have you. Thanks, Javon, not so important. So I wanna talk about the cross of Christ for a minute. Now, uh, what is it in Corinthians, Paul, chapter 2, I don't know, First, Second Corinthians, he says, I'll know nothing else besides the cross and Christ crucified, right? What he accomplished for us on the cross. Because sometimes, you know, you got to get to the cross before you can get to the resurrection, right? It has to come in order. Our lives, we need to feel, realize that the old man was crucified. It is dead in Christ and that we're to live this new life. We can't get to the new life until we get that right. You know, we understand that. So I want to talk about this cross and the physical cross that Christ spoke. And it's not so important, but I'm sharing something that relates to life here. So the word for the cross is generally storus or storos. I don't know how you said it. Anyways, and this word means that the cross that Christ was on is a term that also is used as tree. And it means a vertical stake, a vertical stake. So what happened is today, I'll draw this. So we have the, you know, my simple, amazing drawing skills, right? <laughs> We're not here for art lessons, are we? So we have the cross of Christ that he's crucified on, correct? Now, the scriptures would indicate that the cross that Christ was on was actually a stake, more like this, so that his, so you got that, I hold up along. So instead of like this, the scriptures would indicate it was more like this, but you'll see where I'm going, not so important, right? So that actually, instead of his arms being out to his side, they were above him like this and staked through the medial verve or nerve or whatever that was right there. And then his legs were below him. This is something that, a person asked me about once. So a person asked me about this, and we were discussing this. And I go, well, the understanding of Scripture is that it was actually a stake, because it says it's a tree. And uh, in two places it says it's a tree, using that symbol. Now, he said, it's so important. He's telling me this. This guy's telling me that It's so important that we know the difference, whether it was a cross like the top one or a cross like the bottom one. You know what? In the matter of life and things... I don't think the opinion or whatever really matters. I don't think it matters. But because of that, because I, you know, we were sharing these things and talking about, it, he says it's like this, and because I don't tr teach this, I teach he was cru crucified and what he accomplished for us on the cross. 
that he wasn't going to fellowship with me, right? Because I wasn't teaching truth. Well, my thing is, we are teaching truth because we're teaching and sharing to walk in Christ crucified, took our sin to the cross, took our failure, took our defeat, took our discouragements, took our disappointments, took worries. He took it all to the cross so that in his resurrection, the new life could be released. So does it matter if it's this or this, it, it's an, it doesn't really matter. And so if my opinion is, my understanding of scripture, it's like this, and yours it's like this, you know what? Can we just kind of fold it over like this, put it under the table, maybe just burn it and let it go? Because in the, 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 the plan of eternity, it doesn't matter because he was crucified he was buried, and he was raised from the dead, and we have new life. Are we going to magnify what, right? Not important. Yes. So that's the Storus, the cross, and you find that uh, when they carried him out, Matthew 27, 32, they compelled Simon of Cyrene to, to carry the cross, the Storus, you know, and you can look up the Greek word and all that. It's in there. A stake or post set up right. And then later they added the cross thing. And in Acts 5, 30 through 32, the God, the God of our fathers raised Jesus. He starts off, a God raised Jesus from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead? God did. Jesus didn't raise himself <laughs> or whatever. God exalted him. Oh my gosh. God exalted him at his own right hand, right? At his right hand, we say the hand of blessing, right? You know, all his hands are blessings. Now, in the Old Testament, I heard a teaching once, somebody goes, well, if you're on the left hand of God, you're on the hand of cursing. Well, I'm telling you, all that God has done for us in Christ is poured out blessings, all spiritual blessings. He never says, I've poured out curses on you, does it? No, he says, Christ became a curse for us because cursed is everyone that hangs on a cross, right? So that's that's cleaned out. So we're more in the Deuteronomy 28 section where it says, if you'll do diligently do the word of the Lord, all these blessings will come to you. Well, the blessings have already come for the believer. That was the Old Testament. If they followed his commandments, they would come. In the New Testament, we have them. The choice is to walk in them, walk in the blessings, the abundance, the supply of our Father. So God exalted him, and of course we know highly exalted him in his own right hand as a leader and savior, like captain, right? To give repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins, and we are witnesses. And this is before the Gentiles came in in Acts 10, right? So as far as they know, their paradigm or whatever their understanding is Israel. But the church is made out of Jews and Gentile, which, you know, is made out of that one group, two groups, Ephesians 2, made one, so reconciling them, making peace, and now we have the church of God. It isn't, it isn't Jew or Gentile that are, you know, uh, Greek, as some would say, or Judean that's so important. It's the church of God, the calling that he, we've been called to. So forgiveness of sins, and we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. His promise, confess with Jesus as Lord, believe God raised him from the dead. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? So and in Galatians 3.32 also speaks about the tree in that verse, Acts 5.30, killed and hanging on a tree. Okay, so. Now I want to tie in tree, but I'm going a totally different direction. We're, we're, we're jumping that ship and we're getting on another ship here. So this is in Matthew 24, 27 through 35. So from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near, right? When spring comes, things warm up, the sap starts flowing in the trees, leaves put out their little buds or whatever, and then, a, you know, a leaf's going to come for it, summer's near, right? Pretty easy. So when you see these things, you know uh, that uh, these things, you know that he is near. So I got to go back a little bit. Summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. True, I say, and this is, you know, really about Christ and his life. That's always, it came back to Christ, who he is, what he accomplished. The whole subject of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is Jesus Christ. It is. So, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass 
away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, we've got this little parable or sharing about this fig tree. I ran into a believer once, and we got talking about, and he was in this ministry, and their whole foundation is on this one verse about the fig tree. So I don't remember what the ministry is called. Maybe some of you have been in it, are in it, or have heard of them. But I think to take a parable like, or an account like this, and build our whole ministry on one single word, you know, we're the fig tree ministry, I don't know that that is we're really hitting the heart of the matter. If you really want to build your ministry on something, how about the love of God in Christ, the, the life he gave and paid for us, right? The death, burial, resurrection, all about love. No greater love has a man in this than he lay down his life for his friends. I call you my friends because I tell you what I'm about to do, right? Wouldn't, if we're going to make our ministry about something, how about the love call, the love way, the love life? And I did a series on that, and I'm thinking about it. Oh my gosh, three months ago on the love call, the love way, and the love life. So, um, I don't think we should just take one verse and make our whole doctrine, our whole life about it, right? It was like that cross thing. Well, does it really matter? You know, because you know, people were so easily offended. We can be, and we shouldn't be easily offended. And so we have that example in Scripture when someone gets offended. If you have a brother offended, it says, leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with God. How often do we want to make it right with God and forget about the part of making it right with the friend? No, God says, you know, how does the love of God dwell in us if we have a supply in our hands and we see a brother in need and we keep it to ourselves? How does the love of God dwell? If we're not willing to go make it right with our husband, our wife, our friend, whoever, it is, then something is wrong, right? There's something wrong in Chinatown or somewhere. Okay, now we're just kind of having fun today. We're having fun today. So it's not worth separating over matters that don't matter. You get that? Matters that don't matter, things that don't matter. Now, do you think that Jesus had an opinion on things? I would like your response. So you can put a one or a Y for yes or a two or an N for no. Do you think that Jesus had an opinion on things? Things of life, whatever. And there's going to be no right or wrong answer. How, how about we do that? Everybody's in the safe zone. So Pam, Christ had an opinion. Uh, in awe of him, yes. Robert, uh, yeah, yes, one. David, good morning, David. So good to have you here. Um so, and others of you putting, putting that in the tree, yes, Diane says yes. So I'm going to give you a verse that probably you haven't looked at. I'm going to read it from the old King James, and that's not even really old, right? We're, we're just going back to 1611 or so. A couple, you know, how many hundreds of years that is. Luke 17, 7 through 10. Luke 17, 17, Luke 17, 7 through 10. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say to him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? So we're in this thing of, does Christ have an opinion on things? Go down and sit to meet. Will we not say unto him, now this is a servant plowing in a field, doing, you know, a hired servant, whatever. And will he say, the master, who's going to say to him, the master say to him, by and by, when he has come from the field, go sit down and eat. Does the master tell the servant when he comes in from the field, go sit down and eat? Uh, and he, will we not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may eat, you know, I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have drinken and drank. And again, drunken, this is uh, King James. And afterward, thou shalt eat and drink. Doth, doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him, I trow not, T-R-O-W. Now it sounds like I'm doing cement work with a trow or something, right? Come back to this. So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which is our duty to do. In other words, if we do what we're supposed to do, now, I have, my children do things they're asked to do, they do, and I still sometimes thank them, you know, but it's their duty, you know, it's kind of like a duty to do, a household duty was they were growing up, it was expected of them. Do I need to thank them? No, not really, because it's expected of them to walk in, in 
and respect and love toward the whole family. So what Jesus is saying, does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. That is old King James, for I think not, or I imagine not. It means my opinion is no. And I believe Jesus Christ, in his opinion, spoke truth. In our opinions, we don't always speak truth. Now, in some of the newer versions, they take this out of this section. But anyway, no. He thought, no, when a servant comes in, he, the master generally is not going to say, sit down and eat, I'll take care of you. No, the servant's coming from the field. Now you're going to take care of the master and feed him and so forth. Does that make sense? So did Christ have an opinion or understanding of things? Yes, but he always based it on truth because he said, John 17, 17 or so, or 7, wherever it is, I think it's 17, 7, thy word is truth. And he is perfect theology. He is truth lived out to the nth degree. We can get that, right? So do we have opinions? Do we have opinions? We do have opinions, but our opinions really need to be what God says. And when they have lesser value, it's not really important. We need to let them go. If we're causing division and we're seeing divisions, it's because of opinions, not good, right? The one I shared this once before, I heard it a long time ago in a biblical research class that was uh, amazing. And he was talking about these two churches, a true story that with Adam and Eve, did Adam and Eve have a navel? Yeah, did they have a navel? It would be like, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Did Adam and Eve have a navel? So the group that thought they did have a navel separated into another denomination. The first church, believe this or not, the first church of the navelites. <laughs> really? Did they have an opinion? Was it an opinion worth carrying to cause division? Oh my gosh. Did it really matter? Can't we let the little things go? Aren't there much more important things in walking this love way so that we release and lift people to life. So do we have an opinion? Yes, but our opinion should be tied to our father's truth. So it's like a couple weeks ago, I don't know, a month ago now, maybe a couple weeks ago, I shared an account of a guy that got healed in a wheelchair. We're at this aquarium in Tampa, Florida. I'm with Robert and Patty and he gets healed, and he's been in pain for years, and he leaves pushing the wheelchair instead of sitting in it. And after that meeting, uh, or after that, you know, happened, he was set free, we're leaving the building, and I had talked, it was 10 minutes ago or something, 15 minutes ago, I don't know, that we had talked, and this, this happened, God delivered him. And we came, ran into meeting each other as he's pushing the wheelchair, uh, should we just be thankful he got healed, right? So the thing is, he was in the church of the Nazarene, and now he was in church with Mormons, okay, Mormons. So we're going, ah, oh, you know, the Mor Here, here's an opinion, you know, the Mormons, they haven't got the truth. Okay, fine, I understand, I get it, I, you know, all right, the Bible, we don't add to it, take away all those things. But God healed him. Was God so concerned if he was going to the Mormon church, or was God more interested in showing his love life to this man and seeing him delivered? I used to hear T.L. Osborne would talk about this. He would say that, uh, you know, he'd go to Hindus, he would go to Muslims or whatever, you know, he'd go all the, in, in different denominations and groups, and God would do the same mighty healings works. People would get saved, you know, come to Christ, people would get healed and delivered. God is not so much a respecter of persons, he's a respecter of conditions. And right, we know that from Acts 10, where Peter says God is not a respecter of persons. Because how could a Gentile become a believer when they're like the outcast? They're like, we want nothing to do with them because they don't get in on this. No, God is always bigger than the bubble we build with our opinions. So I think it, it is more important that we bring life and deliverance to people instead of things that cause division. Now, in this walk, we do need to speak truth and we need to hold fast the faithful word. We do. But I'm not going to take my little cross story and so magnify it that I cause division because it doesn't matter. It counts on the scale of 1 to 100, it counts a big fat zero. 
So are we being loving and compassionate like our Father? Are we bringing truth so that people can be set free or to show we have the answers in life? Now, I want to go another little direction with this and we'll probably close it out. Now, later in the week, I said we're probably going to be doing declarations and Pam was doing some of those in her scope a little bit this morning, declaring who we are in Christ. So I want to go a different direction and I think there is value in this truth. And if you don't see it, would you forgive me? Could you could you just have an oversight and say, I don't believe that and let it go? So uh, I've got to get, here we go. Since I don't have this, I've got to uh, pull it up here. So we're going to Hebrews. And we're going to Hebrews chapter 11. And I did a study. I have a blog, uh, New Miracle Life at blogspot.com, you know, through through uh guys at Google or whatever. And I did a very thorough study on this and I, because I do think there's value in it. But look, if you disagree, I'm giving you another. It's okay. We're moving ahead. George, good morning. Amy, what a blessing to have you both here on Facebook Live. And those of you that have additionally come on, on Periscope, uh, appreciate that. So we're going to Hebrews chapter 11. And I think there is value in this one. And that's why I'll share it. But if you disagree, look, <laughs> it's not worth becoming offended. It is never worth it becoming offended. So Hebrews 11, see, well, I'm still in John. For some reason, I didn't go to Hebrews. Let's try that again. I have to hit the verse or something. So now we have this great chapter on uh, this. And uh, verse... 11, 1, chapter 11, 1 of Hebrews. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You know, faith, believing, is our title deed to things not seen that God has promised. In other words, when you get, uh, sometimes you have a deed to a property. You know, you buy a property and before you've actually maybe even stepped on it, you might get the deed to that property. It's uh, probably not as clear as like you'd get a paycheck. You get, if you're working for a company, you get a paycheck. Now it's auto deposit, but you'd get a check. Well, that check is your deed that you're going to be paid, but you still have to deposit it. So faith is because we don't look at things seen, but unseen. Faith is the title deed to what God has promised for us, even though we don't see it yet. Okay, now hope's different, right? Hope's different, but we're not talking about that. I got to get on track here. So uh, let's go down a few verses. By faith, verse 4, by faith, Abel offered a, to God a more acceptable, sa acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Okay, um, by faith, we understand the universe was made. That's three and so forth, so forth. And uh, through his face, though he died, he still speaks, okay? But the blood of Jesus' blood, his life and all, speaks a better word, Hebrews says. So, by faith, Enoch, Enoch, I'm sorry, Enoch was taken up so she not see death. So now we have this teaching, right, that Enoch, because he pleased God in the Old Testament in Genesis, that he never died, right? We have this teaching, and I would say 95% or more of the churches teach that Enoch uh, did not die, right? Would we agree with that? Okay. So, but context is vitally important in the word. If we're going to walk in freedom and liberty, context is important. So this has a little bit of study in it. Okay. And again, I did this study that I went in much more detail that's on my uh, blog, which I, when I post there, which isn't too often, I usually put a link on Facebook to it. So Enoch was taken up so he should not see death um, and was not found because God had taken him. Now, therefore, he was taken, he was committed as ha commended as having pleased God. So without faith, we have this incredible verse. Without faith, Hebrews 11, 6, it is impossible to please him, God, for whoever, you know, whosoever, whoever is going to draw near to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek them, or the King James says, diligently seek him. So, uh, faith, uh, yeah, George, God is not a respected person yet. Uh, speaking the truth in love, we're living in love. That's the love way. Yes, that's uh, George. 
Now, faith brings hope into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is the it is all the evidence required to prove what is unseen. And that's Hebrews 11, 1, the passion translation. So there you go. Woohoo! See? Influence and adding in. So here we said, verse 6, without faith, believing it's impossible to please God. Um, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God concerning events as unseen, in reverent fear, constructed the ark saving, you know, his household. By faith, Abraham, right? Verse 8. Uh, by faith, he went out into the land. By, you know, Isaac, Isaac with faith, uh, looking for the city whose designer and builder was God. Sarah herself received power. Verse 11. Uh, therefore, uh, one man, let's see, I'm going to find a spot. Now, verse 13 is vital to this verse. Jeff Bramlett, we're talking like 20, 30 years ago, huh? Still alive, we're still kicking. Oh my gosh. Anyway, good to have you here for a minute, Jeff. So this verse 13 is vital to our understanding. And again, to really get it, you'll have to ask me for my link to my blog because I put this in detail step by step. So these all died in faith. So I was talking to a minister once about this, and I go, here it says these all died in faith. If this word is true, then Enoch died, and he's not in heaven, or whatever. Because he died. That's, that's the point I want to make right now, that he died. Or the word's not true, and that's not what it's saying. It's saying some died, or a few died, uh, only certain ones died, but that's not, God is no respecter of persons. And it says it is appointed unto men, all men, unto Hebrews 2.14, power of death is the devil, somewhere, in, that is appointed unto man once to die. So, and then there's the second death and all that, right? We're not going there right now. So these all died in faith, not having received the promise, and having seen them, greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So now we have a clear scripture, very clear, that these all died. In this context, Enoch died. What happens is that we haven't understand the words God has used. When we look in the Old Testament that God translated him, it never says he translated him or transported him to heaven. It says that he was translated that he should not see death. See with the C there is to see with the physical eyes, to see death with the physical eyes. You don't see your own death. You see other people die. And so what happened is when you see someone die, that's, that's deep. If you're in a hospital or someone in a car wreck or something, someone dies, that is pretty hard. And we're supposed to be raising people from the dead, right? That's what we, Jesus says we're about to be doing, praying for the sick, uh, raising the dead, casting out devils, and so forth. This is something we are called to do, and we're empowered to do. Every one of us is anointed with the same anointing. We have different ministries, but the same anointing of how God anointed Jesus with Holy Spirit power. Do you have Holy Spirit and power? Then you have the same anointing, powerful Holy Spirit. So the context is clear he died. What happens if you look in your Strongs and all this, you can find that they changed the meaning over the years to that translation that he was transported to heaven. And the newer versions, like I believe the NIV, have now put that in there like he's transported to heaven. But it's never in the Hebrew in the old where it speaks of him, and it's never in the Greek in the new. It never says that Enoch was translated to heaven heaven in the sense that he's sitting up there in the right hand with Jesus and all of them. He was transported, translated, that he would not see someone physically die and have to go through the grief of actually seeing someone die in front of him. Because he pleased God, God took him away from that so he wouldn't physically see someone die. And if you look at my blog, I put this in detail. Or you can believe the common teaching that he was translated, is in heaven, but you're going to have real trouble when you look at the verses related to it. And in the context, these all died in faith, not having received the promise. Okay, or what the things promised. So 
Now, I think there's value in that, not like the cross example I gave, but I think there's value in understanding that because there's people that have pleased God and walked with God, and it doesn't say they were transported to heaven. Hey, are you endeavoring to walk, to please God, to walk in a love way with him? And so think about it, consider it, and you can, Angela, good morning. God is good all the time. He is. So you can go where that with you want. But the context is clear, and if we actually research out the history of it, this is a newer idea that came about in the last, like, 100, 200 years, uh, more recently, that he was transported to heaven. The, everything that's of old never indicates that. So, we've got through that. We've cleared that out. You can take with it, do what you want. You can find my blog where I go into greater detail and go step by step and follow it in the Old and New Testament. So do we each have insights and understandings, opinions, but our opinions need to be the word and things that don't matter, we need to let go. That is love. We don't hold on to the past, right? Unforgiveness. We don't hold hardness. We don't hold bitterness. We don't have unthankfulness, right? Aisha, we don't. We don't. It's just not who we are. Ours is to lead people to life. And if God can heal that guy in the wheelchair and, you know, and he goes to a Mormon church, I think God cares more about if people are touched by his love so that then they can receive his truth, then we get them in the right, all the right truth, and then show them the love. No, it is all about love. Truth is enveloped in his love, and this is the way we need to walk. So, I have so many more things here, uh, but I think, I think I've gone where I'd like to go. You know, I think sometimes, do we need to I do. I, I'm human, and you do this too. Do we need to study more? Do we need to go do more? Well, we need to just live life. Because what happens is we'll be critical of ourselves. Uh, there is a link to my page in my bio, FC, the letter F, the letter C, like Frank Christ or Frank Cat or something, uh, space, far well, F. A R far well W E L L. You'll find me on Facebook. Kind of looks like this guy. So, anyways, uh, you're welcome there. And if you contact me through through Messenger or my emails in there, uh, the firecatchercox.net, I can send you that link if it interests you to look at. But you know what? I do not want us to divide over this truth. I want us to walk in love because it's important. We are setting people free and not putting them into more captivity, right? We're not here to bring people into captivity and to put, uh, you know, our our form on them. The form we received is the life of the God and Christ in us. So why don't we go forth? You'll never pray enough, right? You can pray always, pray without ceasing. Anybody here ever met that verse? You know, first. Uh, Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing and everything, give thanks. Have we always given thanks and everything? Have we always prayed without ceasing? Uh, prove all things. Have we proven all things? These are things that we're supposed to do, but have we always done it? So all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's why Christ came. Can we not see who we are and recognize the same in others, their value, their potential, and the calling on their life to help them walk into who they're created to be and let the lesser things go. So I love you. Have an incredible day. Let's not just walk with God in faith and believing and love. Let's not run with him. Let's be like eagles and soar above the depravity of this world and release life wherever we go. Yes, yet by faith, God favors and never fails. And yes, Yes, I believe God can heal me. I don't, but I, oh, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to repeat this. In this class I took a number of years ago, there was, uh, he, this minister was teaching in like, do you know where it was? Was it India? I think it was India, George. Um, he was in India and he heard these teaching and God was doing wonderful things. Well, as this minister was getting on the train to leave the town, Delhi or whatever it was, a person came up to the train window and says, it is India. Robert says it is India. So he comes to the train window and he says, um, I believe if you will pray for me, I will be healed. 
but I don't believe in your Jesus. I believe that if you pray for me, I'll be healed, but I don't believe in your Jesus. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to, sorry, you're, you don't get in or are you going to walk in love? He walked in love. He ministered healing to the guy. His arm that's all withered up gets healed. He gets delivered. What are you going to do? We're going to walk in love with one another. So thanks, Facebook. Have an incredible day. Well, his arm was healed. Yes, his withered up arm, as I remembered, was healed. And I don't believe in your Jesus, right? God's bigger than our doctrine because his love supersedes doctrine. But do we need doctrine? Are we to study it? We need doctrine, reproof, and correction. We do so we can stay on track. We don't want to be off track. Uh, Paul, so I'm going to let Facebook go. I'm going to talk on Periscope for another minute here. Love you all. You're all amazing creation reality of God. Yes, you do. So good, Angela. Bye, George. Angela, Amy, whoever's on here. Jeff. Um, I know there's a few others here. Gary. Gary snuck in. I missed you. And uh, love you all. If I didn't mention your name, Judy, <laughs> you are who God has called you to be. And you will do his mighty works. And you will show the love call, the love way, the love life to others. Bye-bye. Okay, so there goes uh, there goes the old Facebook. Loud. The volume is up. So anyway, let's let's learn to crush the enemy with love because he's all hate. He's all about dividing. He's all about breaking up families, communities, churches, fellowships. He's all about that. How about we learn how to love so that we break that off? And we actually grow up into this glorious church, lit up with the light of God, and release people wherever we go. How about we find the truths that liberate instead of the truths that divide? If, I, if I'm even saying that right. So, um, I, I, <laughs> you know, in our culture... We give each other a handshake, you know, we agree. men do usually, usually men, sometimes women, right? If they put out their hand, I was taught, you know, if the woman puts out her hand to shake it, if she doesn't, you know, put your eyes out or something. I just sense that God, we have the handshake from heaven. We've been given, you know, God has put us in a place of friendship and sonship, even greater. And it is holding nothing back on us, nothing back from us. How about we learn to walk in the fullness of who we're created to be and release life everywhere we go? 